in. Is this where the damn drumming and the music kicks in? Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot going on in the world, a lot is changing, a lot is happening in the global news, a lot is happening in the U.S. news. Just to put it in perspective for you, the number one song in October of 2012, it was Maroon 5, One More Night. I had to look that one up, I had to play it on YouTube, but as soon as it started playing I knew exactly what song it was. You know what song that is. It was the number one song in October of 2012. Look it up on YouTube, after the podcast. But... The number two song, Whoop Up Gangnam Style, Whoop, Whoop, Whoop. That was the number two song in, in the country. The Billboard Hot 100, that was number two. Number three is We Are Never, Ever, Ever Getting Back Together. Taylor Swift, that was the year that uh, her, I think it was the Red album, one of those albums. It was the year that Taylor Swift put out that one big album. I think it was Red. Looking at movies, that was the year The Avengers came out. Remember the Avengers when, I think, is that the one that sparked the whole superhero thing? Or was there a bunch of superhero ones already and then Avengers was all of them getting together? I don't know the premise behind it. I, I can't watch those movies. I have seen the Avengers, but it was, this was when the Avengers came out. Another movie that came out, The Dark Knight Rises. One of my favorite movies of all time. I would go ahead I would go ahead and say that is one of my favorite movies of all time. Batman: The Dark Knight Rises, which is ironic cuz a second ago I just said that I don't watch the superhero movies. Apparently there's like a big turf war between these superheroes and these superheroes. I think it's DC and Marvel. Somebody is listening to me talk about this right now getting very upset and to you I apologize. I don't know anything about that stuff, but The Dark Knight Rises, that was like that wasn't all that wasn't like you're not like shooting stuff or turning into a Hulk or nothing. Like that was just a rich dude with some money. And then a clinically insane dude that painted his face. Like that could be real. It was kind of realistic. But one of my favorite movies nonetheless. The Hunger Games. Katniss Everdeen. That was actually filmed right down the road from me. The majority of it was filmed in North Carolina. And I know the people whose property a lot of it was filmed at in Concord, North Carolina. And uh, yeah. Um, Jennifer Lawrence one of my celebrity crushes, but she was the star of Hunger Games. Hunger Games came out in 2012. Egypt. Egypt had their first ever democratic election where the people actually got to vote and elect their leader. That happened in 2012. Uh, the, the London Olympics. That was in 2012. Michael Phelps over there dominating. I think that was the year Henry Cejudo won a gold medal for wrestling. Jordan Burroughs. Won a gold medal in wrestling at the London London Olympics. It was also the year of the Benghazi attack. The U.S. Embassy in Benghazi. That's the one that uh, Hillary Clinton had all the emails about. That's the one where it was raided and not one U.S. shot was fired. There's a lot of stuff. I'm not going to get into politics. This, this did not mean to turn political. Just going over current events. But the Benghazi attack that you hear so much about, that happened in 2012. Coney 2012. Who remembers Coney 2012? I make references sometimes about Coney 2012, and no one knows what the hell I'm talking about. But it was like the biggest thing to ever hit social media for like a day and a half, and then no one ever talked about it ever again. It was a video that went around about some African war leader, drug lord, that enlisted and enslaved all these children and made them into child warriors and they were eight-year-olds with AK-47s taking over the African government and Coney must be stopped. Coney 2012. Hashtag Coney 2012. It was a big old thing. I remember it happening. It was huge. Like, if you even said something bad about it in that day and a half time frame, you were called all sorts of names and it was bad. But uh, yeah, Coney 2012 happened in 2012. My first MMA fight 
was in 2012. I started training in MMA. I guess it had to have been 2011. And I got my blue belt in 2012, and I had my first amateur fight in 2012. Basically, the point that I'm getting at, all this stuff seems like forever ago. Think about the last time, like that that Taylor Swift song. When was the last time you heard? Think about The Dark Knight Rises. That's like almost a classic movie in my mind. And that came out in 2012. The Hunger Games, same thing. Hunger Games feels like it came out a lifetime ago. When you think about the London Olympic, all those current events, seems like it happened forever ago. My first MMA fight, hell, that was that was at 145. I don't want to say how much I weigh now, but I'm about to give it up. That was 70 pounds ago. If <laughs> Oh, my God. Maybe I shouldn't have added that one on there. I should have taken that one off the list. That was 60 to 70 pounds ago that I had my first MMA fight. So... The point is, all of these things happening in 2012, you're probably like, what is this obsession with 2012 all of a sudden? All of that stuff was happening the last time someone won a GNCC XC1 overall championship that was not named Caleb Russell. That is how long that string of dominance went. Over those eight championships, the last time somebody won one, I believe it was Paul Wibley. I should know that, but I would bet most of my bank account on it was Paul Wibley. Pretty sure. Uh, yeah, that was the last person not named Caleb Russell that won a GNCC championship, and that was what was going on at the time. That's how long it's been since that number one plate was given to somebody besides Caleb Russell. It just so happens that it was given to Caleb Russell's predecessor, on the same bike, so now we're going to see another orange number one KTM all of next year, but Ben Kelly. So, last week's show, if you listened to it, thank you, appreciate it, I think it stunk, and it last week a whirlwind hit me with work, I lost Monday, traveling back from Ironman, I was out of town literally all of the rest of the days of the week, working 10, 11, 12 hour days, I had to fit something in there, but I was just so mentally drained that I felt like the show wasn't what it could be. And it's these things I'm talking about right now that really put it in perspective for me how crazy this whole season was and how the culmination of that season finale at Iron Man came to be because it's something that is worth talking about. It's worth mentioning, and I feel like I did not do it justice in the way that I talked about it. So, first of all, thank you. And second of all, I'm sorry, trying to make these things worth your listening time. If you have seeked out On The Pipe Podcast, I appreciate you more than you will ever know because right now we're at a point where more people are listening to this podcast than have ever listened to it before. And coming off of that episode about the whole point situation, as I mentioned on the last show, that quickly became the most downloaded episode ever. I think three or four days after I posted it, It overtook all of my all-time downloads. So then I'm like, all right, season finale. Coming off the best show we've ever done. We got to put one out that's good, that's entertaining. And I feel like I did not deliver that to you guys last week. And it came late, but I was battling a lot of different things last week. So, thank you. Sorry. Hello and welcome. Today is Tuesday, November the 2nd. 2021. I'm your host, as always, Tyler Shepardson, and this is OTP Tuesday on the Pipe Podcast. Thank you for being here. We appreciate it. Trying to get back in the swing of things. We are heading into an off season that we're going to try to get you through. I got some stuff lined up, some interviews coming, uh, some content that I've kind of saved throughout the season to push to the off season, so that way we have something to get us through November. December, January, most of February. Uh, We'll have Zach Hayes' series down here, Carolina XC. That'll be going on, so that'll give us something to talk about, something to cover, and something to look forward to. But other than that, we're going to try to keep things rolling out for you all. I don't know what the future of the podcast is going to look like over the over the winter break, whether there will be OTP Tuesdays or whether we'll just be putting out a regular full-length interview show each week. But Nevertheless, we will bring you something to keep you engaged because I appreciate you guys coming back here and I appreciate you guys checking out On The Pipe Podcast. As always, be a friend. Tell a friend if you like the show. 
go ahead and send it to them. Subscribe, whatever you're listening to this on, go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Maybe give us a rating if you want to give us five stars. If you don't want to give us five stars, maybe, hey, you know what? You worked hard today. Don't take your time. You don't need to leave a review. If you, if this isn't the greatest podcast that you've ever listened to. Okay, let me let me back up. This is not the greatest podcast anybody's ever listened to. But if you want to give me five stars anyway, go ahead and go do that. Subscribe where you're listening. But eh, maybe if you don't want, maybe if you won't give it three stars, that's fine. Just tell me don't. Hey, you've worked hard. You don't need to leave a review if that's the case. Um, it's not even worth it. No, you th- it's not even worth it. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, yeah, thank you guys for listening. For real, uh, it really means a lot to me. It's really cool. One thing I did mention last week is that we had an interview with AMA Off Road Racing Manager Eric Kudla, interviewing the 2021 National Hare and Hound Champion Joe Wasson. He wrapped up that championship. The same weekend as Iron Man for that factory beta team. He's got a really cool story. I know I kind of alluded to that last week and I said, you'll learn more about it in this interview. And then I forgot to put the interview in the show. So uh, a good bit of people reached out to me and said, hey, man, you said there was an interview. There was an interview. What's happening? And I said, hey, man, completely forgot. My bad. So that interview with Joe Watson will be at the end of the this episode is a really good one. You want to check it out. But it also did give me an opportunity to find out and remember that last year around this time or last year around October, a video went semi-viral viral around the interwebs and it involved Joe Wasson. And I remember this video, but I did not remember that it was Joe Wasson and his son TJ Wasson. But I don't know if it's somebody that listened to the show and went back and found where I posted the video on Facebook and liked it, or if it was just a coincidence that they liked it, but shortly after I put out that show last week, I found out that this video pertained to Joe Wasson and his son TJ Wasson, and it clicked in my mind like, oh my goodness, Like I totally remember that video because it's one of my favorite videos I've ever seen. But I forgot that it was Joe Wasson, so I'm glad that that gave me an opportunity to talk about this video that... It is on my Facebook. I'm going to try to share it. Uh, maybe I'll reach out to Joe and see if I can uh, repost it on Instagram or something. But basically, it's one of the coolest, like, most wholesome videos I've ever seen. The kids are racing in a youth race, and this is, like, desert racing. It's dusty. It's fast. Uh, they're out in the middle of the desert, it appears. And a rider with a GoPro on falls over, and their leg gets stuck underneath their bike. Well, then all of a sudden, another rider comes up. And these are 65s. These are little guys. Another rider comes over and says, do you need help? The guy says, yeah, I can't get my bike off of me. So the one kid comes over, lays his bike down, gets off his bike, comes over, picks the other kid's bike up off of his leg, makes sure the kid gets out from underneath it. And as he's picking it up, he's handing the bike back over to the kid. And he said, I know this cost me a lot of positions, but it's worth it helping somebody. And then asks if the kid's okay, and then just goes gets on his bike and rides away like nothing happened. But I, it probably sounds dumb talking about it, but it seriously is like one of the most wholesome videos I've ever seen. But that was Joe Wasson, and Joe Wasson's son, TJ Wasson, that actually did that. And TJ Wasson is the one that is quoted saying, I know that cost me a lot of positions, but it was worth it helping somebody as he stops his race and postpones it to help get another rider's bike off of him. But that video alone... I think does wonders in letting you know just the type of guy that Joe Wasson is and just the type of kid that he is raising in TJ Wasson. So nevertheless, that will be coming at the end of this episode. I already got it in here. It is ready. You are going to hear it. This is not going to be the second week in a row that you hear me talk about that interview. Without hearing the interview, you're going to hear the interview. It's at the end of this. Once again, it was AMA Off-Road Racing Manager Eric Kudla, who was out there handing out number one plates for the National Hare and Hound event. And uh, he sat down and got a quick interview with Joe Watson. So really appreciate Eric for doing that and really appreciate Joe for taking out the time. And hopefully we can get Joe on the show in the coming weeks. And I want to talk to him about his son TJ and see how his son TJ ended up for the year and how he ended up in that race because it was a cool video. Anyway, other than that, we got a little bit to talk about this week. Not a whole lot going on in the world of off-road It is currently 11.43 p.m. on an OTP Tuesday night. 
and I'm trying to bang this thing out. I got to go to work at six o'clock in the morning. Got at least like seven and a half hours worth of online training to do uh, as soon as I get to work in the morning. And then I got to go to a job site right after that. And then Thursday, I have to go sit in another class all day long. And I'm trying to get the show out to you and let you know what is going on. Like I said, not a whole lot of bullet points, but there's some there's some cool stuff happening going on in the world. Um, first thing, I don't want to discount the last race. I don't want to discount this whole ending to Ironman. What a crazy way that it was to end. If you saw anything from that race, you saw just how gnarly the conditions were. If you were one of the 8 million people that were there, which I hear... I did hear that they're saying it was around 13,000 people with spectators too. I think it was 2710 for um I think it was 2710 for participants and then another uh 13,000 through the gate that bought armbands so there could have been more than that that did not get armbands and and happened to get around and just were there hanging out, but that is impressive numbers to go to a cornfield in a bad weather weekend in the middle of Indiana to watch some people race some dirt bikes and some four wheelers. Those are pretty impressive numbers. I mean, 13,000 people. When you include those people in the rider participants, you're looking at half a million dollars in a weekend that was made at that GNCC race. Um, which it is cool to have a series as big as GNCC and as prestigious as GNCC. But over half a million dollars made just off of armbands and race participants. It'd be cool if the winner got paid more than $1,250. But that is just my completely unprofessional opinion. That's how much it costs. Or that's how much it pays to win a GNCC 1250 to the overall winner. So Thad Duvall, overall winner in Ironman. GNCC says, hey, we made half a million dollars. Here's your $1,200. Thanks for coming. And, uh, hey, amateurs, thanks for ruining your bikes. No, I mean, it it is, it's an awesome series. It's a prestigious series. They do what they can with what they got. And in a situation like that, I do not envy the, the track crew that has to salvage that track at the last minute. They have a, a track set up a week in advance, all ready to go. And then all of a sudden the rain comes rolling in. They got to amend it, make some changes. They run the morning race, morning race. People get stuck everywhere. And then all of a sudden they got to amend the track again because now it's raining even harder. There's a championship on the line. We got to figure something out. They go out in the woods, completely change the whole thing and make it a raceable, rideable track and get the race out there, get the race done and crown a champion. It is, uh, for the most part, pretty well oiled machine, what they have going on over there. But it was cool to see that big of a turnout at a dirt bike race in the middle of a cornfield. The leaders, once again, to reiterate, they lapped all the way up to 15th place. So, out of everybody that was in that pro afternoon, and keep in mind, this was not three hours, this was only two hours. So, if they had a third hour, they probably would have lapped, I would say, a significant amount higher than 15th place. But lapping all the way up to 15th place was still absolutely impressive. The first people to not be on that lead lap were the top amateur battle of... um, Oh, no, that's not right. It's our 250A battle of Bubs, Tasha, and JoJo Cunningham. But it was Tristan Landrum. He got 10th overall that ended up getting top amateur. So our top amateur was on the lead lap. Bubs and JoJo, they were uh, right there. They were the fastest ones to complete four laps rather than the leaders five laps. But one interesting to note, too, one of the last major mud races, one that was really bad or comparably bad to this one, was all the way back to the Penton in 2008. Now, the Penton in 2008, it was a rough one as well. It was a super muddy, super gnarly race as well. In that race, the leaders lapped all the way up to 6th place. So, 7th place overall was not on the lead lap. Think about for think about that for a second. That is insane. These riders lapped all the way up to 6th place. You know who the last rider on the lead lap of that one was? Flying Ryan Eccles, one of the the junior trail bosses at the GNCC. It's it's Ryan Eccles and Jared Bolton that pretty much lay out all the tracks. But yeah, it was Ryan Eccles in the XC2 class. He was the last person to be on the lead lap in that 
muddy mess at the John Penton GNCC in 2008. You know who the first one not on the lead lap was? David Knight. So that means everybody in the top six, including Ryan Eccles, including Josh Strain, including Thad Duvall, including Paul Wibley, lapped David Knight. Do you know what kind of race you have to be having to lap David Knight? It's insane. And it's pretty cool to look back and see. Um, Paul Wibley won that race. Josh Strang, second place in that race. Thad Duvall, fourth place in that race. And the reason I point that out is because who do we see battling for the win on the final lap of this year's Ironman Mud Mess Mud Fest GNCC? Josh Strang and Thad Duvall. Josh Strang led the majority of that race. Thad Duvall led his first lap of the season on the last lap of the season to take the checkered flag on the last race of the season. But I thought that was crazy when I was looking back through the results and, and kind of doing some research and searching back to the other stuff that at the John Penton in 2008, it was those guys that were still up there at the front battling for that win. And now here we are, what's that, 13 years later? And it's still Josh Strang and Thad Duvall up front battling for the overall win. I thought that was pretty crazy when you uh, when you sit and think about it. But yeah, those were uh, just a couple of things I wanted to, to point out and really put it in perspective as far as what is going on in the world of off-road racing, how much stuff is progressing, how much stuff is changing, and uh, what things are going to look like going forward. We put up some videos and some pictures, some sights and sounds from the Ironman GNCC. One thing that I was not anticipating is with the whole Axel Hodges situation, it was cool to kind of see that whole thing and see how everyone interacted with Axel and, and see him do his thing and uh, kind of be there and, and be in the tent when he comes back from the race and talking about the race. And it was just a, a really surreal experience and it was pretty cool to see. One thing I did not anticipate is I just took one little clip. He was out there doing some jumps over the the big old, I guess it's kind of a tabletop, out there in the, the middle. And I put up a reel. And I, I put it up the weekend that we were at, um, at the Ironman. And what I wasn't expecting was for this thing to do what it did. I've never... So this is officially the most watched thing that I've ever put out in my entire life. I'm trying to pull it up right now, and I keep trying to give the roundabout ways while I'm trying to find... Oh, here we go. So, I put this thing up. Totally not expecting this. So far, it has reached 2,824,421 accounts. So, that's not the plays. That's how many individual accounts have watched this dumb video that I put up. Just on a whim. It's I think it's seven seconds or eight seconds. It's been shared or sent seven thousand one hundred ninety six times as of right now. And it's gotten the OTP page more followers than I thought I could ever have in my life. We're about to hit ten thousand followers and I think before Iron Man it was it had just hit four thousand. So it's crazy. One little video can go out there and do all that. So if you are one of these folks that are out there taking pictures or you're taking videos or Maybe you want to start a podcast. Maybe you want to get involved in the sport. Just get out there. Go out there. Aim a lens. Point a microphone to somebody. Go talk to somebody. Go do something. Because like 90% of it is just being there and putting this stuff out. I had no anticipation of that thing doing what it did. And now that's like, as far as like Instagram is concerned, that's the best thing that's ever happened to OTP. And it was just a six second clip, seven second clip. And it's just, it's cool that that partnered right after the the podcast itself is starting to take off too. So um, it, I don't know, it was just, it's kind of surreal. And OTP is something I've been working on for over four years now. Uh, it's been about four and a half years. And that's, I'm just, I know I've rambled about it before on here, but I'm just eternally grateful for everyone that has listened to the show at any point in your history. And if you continue to listen to this show, I'm very, very grateful and very thankful for that because now it feels like after four and a half years of trying to figure this out and trying to figure out what works, what doesn't work, trying to figure out what you guys want to hear, how you guys want it covered. And, and I'm, it's still a learning process. I'm still nowhere where 
I want to be. I think we're still at the ground floor, but I feel like now we finally got a base. And now that we got that base, um, we got some stuff lined up, and next year is going to be even better. So it did take four years to get to this point, but I think next year is going to be the year that we really grow and really tidy this thing up and button everything up and, and kind of make this um, – what I feel like it can be. So it is really cool. Got some sponsors that are going to be coming on board and still talking to some others to see if we're going to have more of them come on board. So I'm very excited to go into the next season with that. With that being said, as sponsors come on board, we're going to make this thing more exciting. I'm going to get some equipment next year. The plan is to have everything on video as well. So you can still listen to the audio version of the show, just like you're used to doing, but then we will also have video to go with it as well. So really excited to see that stuff kind of falling into place. And it's the little things like grabbing that clip and having the courage to, to post that, that one show. I mean, I'm not trying to sit here and pat myself on the back and I don't want it to sound like that. But when I posted that one about the rules and the rules is the rules and that whole thing, I clicked enter on that show and I was like, all right, this is a fun four years. This is the end of OTP. Everyone's going to blackball me. Everyone's going to get mad at me. Uh, it's been a fun run. That's literally what I thought going into it. And um, lo and behold, it actually turned out that I actually repaired some of those relationships and, and a couple of doors opened and some opportunities opened from that. And um, I'm, I'm forever grateful for you guys for listening and sticking with me for this long. And the only thing that I'm saying is if you have a goal and if you have something in this world or in this in any world really whether it's this or whatever you do for a living or maybe you really like to watch competitive chess playing whatever it is if you aspire to be great or not even great I keep saying these wrong things and it's I feel like it's painting me in a bad light so don't think of me like that if you just want to get involved and you want to do anything in this realm or whatever realm you're going for I mean, what I've been learning is just put stuff out there and eventually it'll catch on. I try to be authentic and genuine in everything that I do. This is my passion. I think that's why doing this show is easier for me. I think I need to be able to do it better. So I, I appreciate any criticism that you may have. But I think one of the, the big things is if I wasn't sitting here talking to this microphone about exactly what I'm talking about, I'd be sitting here on the phone with a buddy talking about the same thing. So... Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like I said before, if I won the lottery, I'm not going to be one of those guys that disappears. If I won the lottery, then I'm only going to get more involved with the sport because this is what I love. This is what I like to do, and I uh, appreciate you for following around, following along, because if you're listening to this right now, that means this is something you're passionate about as well, as far as hearing about dirt bikes. But enough about me. This past weekend... We had a J-Day going on. It was the J-Day season finale. It was at Southwick Motocross, the the legendary, the famous Southwick Motocross track up in Massachusetts. Our reigning and defending and recently crowned XC1 champion Ben Kelly, he went up there to race in that final J-Day of the year. Uh, ended up getting the win. So Ben goes up there as a GP format, two motos. Ben overalls it, which is awesome coming off of uh, his GNCC championship victory, whatever you want to call it. Um, he is no stranger to J-Day. They grew, they, actually, all three of the guys on the podium grew up in the New England area. So Ben Kelly grabs the win. Robbie Marshall will end up in second place overall at the final J-Day, but he will wrap up the J-Day championship. So I'm pretty sure this is number five for Robbie Marshall. If I'm not mistaken, this is Robbie Marshall's fifth J-Day championship. Um, nevertheless, if it is in his fifth, he definitely won it over this past weekend. So big congratulations to Robbie Marshall, the Ripper. And in third place, it was Josh Toth, like both. He went up there, also another New Englander, and good friends with Ben Kelly, and I would, I guess, I would assume Robbie Marshall as well. But Toth gets third place out there in the sands of Southwick, and then um, the other local or regional circuit that I know of was the Mid East Hair Scrambles. They concluded their season 
over the weekend as well. They were in Hickory, North Carolina at the Hickory Airport, one of my favorite Mideast tracks. I currently do not have a motorcycle. It is one of the top things on my priority list. I need to get another dirt bike so I can get back to riding and racing. If I did have, excuse me, if I did have a dirt bike, then the Mideast race is definitely where I would have been over the weekend. But Trevor Bollinger, who we saw lead a lap out at Ironman and get out in the front and battle with those boys a little bit, he goes out to the Mideast hair scrambles, and he's the local legend out there. He grabs that Mideast hair scramble victory. Jonathan Johnson, who now it is finally official, he has released the news that he will be racing for the factory beta team next year in the XC2 class. Jonathan Johnson ends up second place at the Middies Hair Scramble and he wraps up the overall Middies Pro Championship. So when he was on the show just a few weeks ago, that was one of the things that we talked to him about. He said if he gets on the podium, he should be able to wrap up that championship. Well, he got on the podium with a second place finish and he wrapped up that Middies Championship. And then his little brother Brody Johnson, who we've only seen race just a couple of times since breaking his leg at Ironman last year, he gets third place on the Mid East podium at its final event in Hickory over the weekend. So big congratulations to Bollinger for grabbing that win, Ben Kelly for grabbing that win, and then also a huge congratulations to Robbie Marshall for wrapping up the J Day Championship and Jonathan Johnson wrapping up the Mid East Championship. This weekend is the Gobbler Gitter National Enduro. It is the final round of the National Enduro Series, barring complete catastrophic failure and the largest pro turnout of the year. Stu Baylor should be wrapping up that championship this weekend. Um, yeah, I think he's like 26 or 28 points ahead. He's got a pretty good gap in there. So uh, with the amount of pros that are usually in there, it seems like no matter what happens, Stu should be able to to wrap that up. But I'll tell you what, Josh Toad's been putting on a hard charge here at the end of the season. I think he's won two or three in a row, and he's always been up there and battling for the wins regardless. Uh, earlier in the season, he was battling for another win and ended up hydrolocking his bike. We talked to him on the show about that a few weeks ago. So um, that series is going to be – a fun one to watch next year, but it does look like um, Stu should be able to wrap that up this weekend. But nevertheless, those riders are still racing for a check, so it's still going to be a good race to pay attention to. Other than that, not a whole lot going on in the off-road world. I got some stuff lined up, some stuff coming for you this past Friday. I think it was Friday. I was on the Dirt Buzz podcast, so Dale Spangler, he's been around the industry uh, for 29 years, I think he said. I know he spent 11 or 12 years with WPS or Fly Racing, so um, really well known in the industry, been around the industry for a long time. He owns Dirt Buzz Media and started the Dirt Buzz podcast. I was a guest on his show last Friday. I think that will be coming out this week, I think this Friday, actually. I think they're a, a week behind, so whenever that comes out, I'll share it. It's a little bit about me, a little bit about my story and how OTP got started, and yeah, it was just a little bit about how we got from nothing to here. So that was pretty cool. Um, appreciate Dale for having me on. If you want, check out his podcast. He does some long-form interviews with a lot of industry guys. He actually had Kudla on the episode last week, but he's had a, a lot of interesting episodes and a lot of interesting conversations on there as well. So you can check him out if you want. And then, like I said, once that becomes live to the public, I will share that with you all. But um, once again, can't thank you enough for listening and sticking with OTP. It means the world to me. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button. I'm going to be ordering hoodies within the next couple of weeks. So if you want a hoodie, I'll make a post about it, but if you want to go ahead and message me, let me know. I'm going to do them by order only, so I'm not going to get a bunch and then try to sell them. I'm going to get orders, take payment, get hoodies. So if you want a hoodie, be on the lookout for that announcement. We'll get you dialed in with an OTP hoodie. Other than that, I don't believe that uh, there's anything that I'm missing. I am going to put that Joe Watson interview right at the end of this. So as always, appreciate you tuning in to OTP. We will talk to you next week. So, Joe Watson interview, I guess. Yeah. All right. Joe Watson, we're here. You're the 2021 AMA National Hair and Hound Champion. You wrapped it up a week early. Um, but there's a lot more to that story. You've been trying at this a long time. You, like we talked before, your hand left your wrist 
your arm at some point yeah. um, in, in New Mexico, actually. Yeah, Alan McCorda. And, uh, and then before that, you were racing 250s. Mm -hmm. And then before that, you were doing mountain biking, correct? No, I didn't do anything, actually. Um, so I grew up racing dirt bikes, um, and uh, I stopped racing when I was 12. And then I didn't ride a dirt bike till I was 22. And then uh, my buddy talked me into going and buying a KTM 300 and uh, went out there and I'd, I'd, I'd had, we went riding like three times and then there was a local desert race and he was like, hey, um, you know, come race this local race with me. And I was like, shoot, all right. And I went out there and I got fifth overall and I was like, whoa, I haven't, I haven't rode for 10 years. And then uh, I did the Murphy National a month later and got 10th overall and I was like, holy crap, like this is something I could do. And uh, so me and my dad got to talking about things and we uh, ended up buying a YZ 250 two stroke and raced the 250 Pro class. And I ended up having a phenomenal year that year. Um, I won the Heron Hound for the 250 Pro. I won the Sidra series in Idaho. I won the 250 Expert in uh, Utah. And then I won a handful of Moran races too that year. And then uh, uh, Beta called me at the end of the year and then um, yeah, I'd race one, one race with Beta and then going on my second race, I basically went from 60 miles an hour to stop and uh, tore my, you know, ripped my whole hand off and everything. And then, you know, it's been a uphill battle since then, but finally I had, you know, a whole year to where I was perfectly healthy and, you know, things just went, went, went as good as they could have gone, you know, and especially after two years of, um, you know, just missing the championship by so close, you know, this year was, it was incredible, you know, like I, it, it's, it's literally my, my biggest childhood dream has come true. Heck yeah, that's, you know? that's awesome. Yeah. And so, yeah, right after you hurt your wrist, I believe your wife sent me a picture of it right after and it's just like, okay, cause that, that really sucked. You know, that's the, that's the bad luck of, of, yeah. you know, it just happens. It's off-road it racing, you and know, was, you don't you know what's just, coming up next. You had just come on board with Beta. And yeah. I know you had mentioned before that they really supported you. It wasn't, yeah. it wasn't a scenario, it wasn't Puff, it wasn't a scenario where you were like, oh, I just lost my ride I just got. But no. Beta was super supportive, correct? Yeah, so the first thing that went through my mind when I was looking at my bones sticking out of my arm, I was like, oh, there goes my factory ride. And um, they it was actually exactly the opposite. It said in my contract, like if I was to get hurt, you know, they would pay me half of my salary. And um, they were actually so much more stand up about it. They kept me on full salary. They flew my mom down to Texas to pick up my son. And, um, you know, they, they've stood by me 100%, you know, and uh, for that, like, I'm just forever grateful. Yeah, absolutely. And so that was a handful of years ago. Yeah. And so you've stayed with Beta yep. and obviously built that relationship. And how yeah. important is that? I know that there are people that are KTM people and people that are Kawasaki people and then people that also go from team to team. So right. how important do you feel that that Beta relationship that you have with them is? Um, it's huge, you know, and then to be able to win the first national title for Beta is like, it's incredible, you know, and they've, you know, the the owner of Beta Italy called me and, and you know, and, and personally talked to him, you know, and it was like, you know, that's that's epic, you know, like I, I have a good relationship with all the people there and it's like I, I, I'm going to be with them for, for a while, you know. As long but, as you can, right? Yeah, so, it, you know. And so Beta appreciate. is obviously building, I mean, it seems like they're building a stable and they kind yeah. of have across the entire off-road industry with with their women in the yeah on the east coast the men on the east coast gnc national enduro yep. and out here we had uh zane roberts take mm -hmm. the win yeah beta took the win in the women's class with morgan tanky yeah you took the uh championships so yep. there yep. is there something that you know what are the big things that you figured out as a team since when you guys first started coming out to um, the desert races so i like i've said i've been with them since 2017 and the bikes at, like in everything have just gotten a little bit better a little bit better each year and from 19 to 20 we made a good you know um chassis adjustment and uh it it basically took all the good qualities of the previous year and then like made some of the bad qualities better and it was just like once i got on the bike it was like you know like i was like you can win like for sure like there's no yeah. doubt in my mind like this is gonna be the bike you know and it's like i i believe they're gonna be the future of it like 
all of it. You know? Absolutely. They, they've put a lot into their entire program across yeah. the board. So, um, was, is there anything specific? I know they, they have, uh, they've run sack suspension and Marzocchi suspension and different types of things that aren't normal to a lot of other types of bags. Is there anything specific that Beta does that you see as either maybe some people are scared of or, or um, is a benefit that they do? Well, people, like I know people always bag on sacks because they don't know what it is, but sacks comes on like almost every street bike, like Ducati. Like yeah. Ducati's gonna put whatever they want on their bikes and they yeah. put sacks. Yeah. So, like the suspension itself is is really, it's pretty good, you know. Like, yeah. it, and and I know like we have a sack shock and then KYB forks, which is coming stock on them now, and uh, that was a that was a pretty good. I'm not gonna say it was an improvement because my 2019 bike had uh, sax forks, and yeah. it was my one of my favorite sets of suspension. So, like, I it I think it's an improvement in a lot of like the public size, you know, because now they have KYBs. Um, yeah. But. For the most part, um, they there's not a lot of different things they do. They're they're um, basically like our bikes. Any anybody can buy my exact bike. Yeah. You know, there's no secrets. There's no, you know, it's like they they kind of pride themselves on not modifying their their and equipment. It being available to everybody. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So so I like that about it. Um, yeah, I just just all the development and you know the way the the company's headed it's like i see nothing but but good stuff and it's you know so i i don't know like <laughs> it's just yeah it's, yeah it's, it's good so today you jumped on a 125 since you yeah. had wrapped up the title yeah in the class you jumped on a 125 and uh eighth overall yeah so um i i'd watched um uh Ronnie Mack on a 125 at a motocross track and uh, I was like that would be sick and so we started talking about it and then it was like well if you get the championship um, your mechanic can race and then you can race a 125 and so I was like I was like all right you know and then I hadn't ridden a 125 since 2005 so um, I I just seen it but I kind of overestimated it (laughs) and uh, it was it was so fun to get on and and you know come up through the back of the pack i got like a dead last start yeah but it it made me like work so much harder for it it was so cool you know and then yeah to finish eighth overall it was it was pretty awesome you know like i you know i didn't know what to expect after i wrote it when they brought it out here yesterday and i was just like this is gonna be tough yeah. But I made it happen, and you know, I just I can't be more grateful, you know. Absolutely, and so you've got the entire family here. You got your son yeah. with you. You got the wife with you. You got the dogs with you. You know, it's, it's something special about off road and just racing in general, getting to travel with your family, right? Oh yeah, you know, like we we learned so many things. We've seen so many cool places, and and uh, it's just, like you build lifetimes of memories here. You know, it's like you you can't get it anywhere else. You know, and to be able to do it with my family, our puppies, like. You know, this year we're completely set up with a camper, and like it's it's awesome, you know. Like yeah. so, and I like I think next year's just gonna be better. That's what I was gonna perfect segue. So yeah. going into 2022, I mean, you have the number one plate. I know that's always like a target on your back. Yeah. But also, you know, you had a good year this year, looking for even better years. There was good battles this year, and Zane's coming up. Yeah. A lot of the guys are getting really, really fast. And so, more people from Pro 250. What do you got going for 22? Um, I got a, a really pretty solid training program. Um, you know, like, so I think I think I got all that dialed in. Um, there's a couple of suspension adjustments I'm gonna make. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm not really gonna change anything, you know? I'm just gonna keep doing what I've been doing. Um, there's some serious competition coming up. It's like any one of us can win now, you know? And, uh, and with the number one plate, it's like, I've seen a lot of people like just fall apart when when they get it and like in supercross and motocross and stuff like that so it's like you know I gotta just keep focused on my you know main goals and and uh, you know just kind of <coughs> just just stay you know doing the same thing and um, just keep it no don't let it get to you no don't let the yeah. number one get to me and and just stay humble and you know not overconfident you know because it's like like you said everybody's gunning for me now and absolutely. It's like, you know, so it's it's going to be exciting to yeah. see what, what next year has to hold. Are there any bigger events you're looking forward to hitting? Uh, Baja, Vegas uh, Torino. I believe you've raced Vegas Torino several yeah, times. Yeah, I'm doing so. best in the desert, so Vegas Torino. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to solo it again. Um, I think my boss wants us to team it, but we'll see about that. Um, but I want to get into rally, you know. So, yeah. like, I, I was talking to 
uh, Jake Augiebright a little bit ago, and um, I might start, you know, putting together a little bit of a rally effort and, you know, try to mess around with that and see what I can do for Beta. Because I'd be like the first person to do Dakar for the Beta factory. Oh, well, that would be awesome. Yeah. So anything else uh, going on that you want to shout out or? Um, not really. No, we're just doing our thing, racing dirt bikes and, you know, thank God. Having a good time. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, yeah. it's good to talk with you and uh, congratulations you. on the win of the championship and congratulations on eighth overall in the 125 today. I appreciate that, dude. It Heck was yeah. an awesome year, you know, couldn't be more grateful. Good to hear. We'll see what's in store for next time. Yeah.